If that doesn't get you started, nothing else will. That's a band organ going back to the late 1800s. Part of a collection here at Eastern States Exposition. It's a wonderful collection started by a man in Sykeston, Missouri, who has brought it east so that we can all see it and enjoy the music that was once a part of the 19th century. His name is Paul Akins, and Paul, I want you to come on in here and tell us about these wonderful machines. First of all, your home is in Sykeston, Missouri, isn't it? Sykeston, Missouri, yes. Paul, the story of how you got started on this collection some 20 years ago is a fascinating one. It started in uh, a little town in New Mexico, as I recall. Lincoln, New Mexico. Tell me about it. Well, it's, uh, there was a little bar that had been there, I guess, for 100 years, right across the street from the courthouse where Billy the Kid jumped out the window, you know, before Pat Garrett killed him. I think I recall. So I took the family. We were, you know, uh, kind of trying to enjoy yourself. And the little bar was kind of a museum. We walked in, and there sat a Nickelodeon, and I'd forgotten them, you know, for like 20, 25 years. I put a nickel in the thing that didn't work, and I thought, gee, if I could find one, maybe I could get it to play. Well, we found one, and uh, got it to play in. Now, for those who may not be familiar with what a Nickelodeon is, in the true sense, it is not a jukebox. No, it's a thing used before the present-day jukebox. It's really an electric uh, player piano. As a matter of fact, not only is it a piano, but it has cymbals. Some of them had violins in them and various other instruments. All complete orchestras. Some of them had 11 to 12 pieces, uh, different instruments that played all from a paper roll. You had the whole band, and you didn't have to put up with the temperament, eh? That's right, <laughs> and a lot cheaper. <laughs> now, this is not necessarily the type of machine that you'd find in a Western saloon, is it? Oh, no, no. These were made for, like fairgrounds or... Uh, amusement parks or very large rides. They were called band organs. The basic sound is that of an organ, but again, we have just about every instrument represented. Yeah, the brassy part of a brass band. Now, where did you find Sadie Mae, Paul? Well, Sadie Mae is very interesting. We found her uh, originally in Gulf Shores, Alabama, where she'd been in a warehouse for over 10 years. Prior to that, she was used in Grand Rapids, Michigan, on a merry-go-round 64 feet in diameter with two other organs almost as large. What condition was she in? Well, we brought it home in baskets and boxes and uh, uh, cardboard boxes. It was really in a mess. Been down on the Gulf Coast, you know, and all that damp, uh, moist air. And she was, well, it took 43 months to rebuild three of the organs. And did you do this work yourself? Yes. Well, now, did you have any prior experience or knowledge about such machinery? Well, the best knowledge in the world. If you do something wrong, you get to do it over. That's right. If the music doesn't play, you know you've done something wrong. Am that's I right? That's right. <laughs> I suppose that's happened on occasion. Now, the principle is the same, I suppose, as that used in a player piano. Uh, it's exactly the same, basically. All right. Why don't we uh, take a look at one of the music scores, and uh, this way we can tell the story better. Paul, let's get over here. Let, let me reach over and get this one. Here we go. And uh, this is not a roll, as you can see. It's a book. We can hold that up and uh, get a picture of it. And this is based on a principle that goes back, Paul, almost 200 years. Yes, this is a Jacquard card developed by a Frenchman of uh, name Jacquard who started to work on the idea in 1721. He wasn't using it for a music box, was he? No, uh, he was working on something. He had an idea for automatic silk looms. So in 1781, the French were weaving silk cloth from a card very similar to this. And I suppose mechanical fingers would be activated by this roll. Yes, little wooden mechanical fingers to uh, automate the looms, and of course it was water-powered at the time. Incidentally, that music that you hear in the background is not one of the Nickelodeons or band organs. That's a real live band that's going by here at the Springfield Exposition right now. But uh, I don't think they get any more music out of theirs than you do out of this one, do you? It would take about 45 musicians to get what you get out of Sadie Mae. And how loud is Sadie Mae? Well, you can hear her for about three blocks if everything is pretty quiet. And if the wind is blowing the right way or perhaps the other way. Half a mile. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Paul, why don't you get over here and show us how Sadie Mae works. Now, we have to load the machine, of course, and uh, you can do that by uh, putting that on the roll. The principle, I guess, is a, a bellows of some kind blowing air. Is that right? Yes. And the little fingers that they can probably see here 
or the ones that admit air to a pipe. All right, well, let's load her up and uh, start her up. Here we go. Sadie May in action. And uh, what a sound she produces. Come on over here, Paul, so that we can uh, see the machine as we uh, talk. These machines were made and used here in the United States. Some of them were made in Europe, weren't they? Well, uh, this, this organ was made in, uh, of course, France about 1870. Were they used extensively in France as well as the United States? Oh, yes. France, England, all the countries, you know, had fairs and parks, and they were made primarily for that. But America was a great producer of band organs. Of course, uh, they didn't build them quite this big. They built a few, but not many. As a matter of fact, in your collection, you have one from uh, North Tonawanda, New York, I believe. Yes, a little 103 Whirler, sir. That's a really a sweet little machine. There's an interesting story, too, about one of these machines in your collection, which was owned and used by a band of roving gypsies. Oh, that's a gypsy queen. That's a yellow machine directly behind us. Tell me about the story. Well, the gypsies lived on uh, little barges in uh, France, on the canals and rivers, France and Germany, and uh, possibly northern part of Spain. They had the uh, Gypsy Queen mounted on a three-wheel cart, and they'd pull the barge into town, uh, pull the organ off of the barge, go down through the little village streets, entertain the people, pick their pockets and steal their chickens and anything that was loose, you know? Of course, uh, in a compartment in the rear of one of the bell ringers, there's a niche about uh, three inches high and four inches wide and two and a half, three inches deep, where you just pull the back off and you could conceal a watch or a gold ring or a gold coin, anything that would go in. And it would be almost impossible to find it unless you knew exactly where to look. Now, these machines today are powered by electric motors, which operate a bellows. This wasn't the case when they were built, was it? No, it took a, a good, strong-armed man and lots of cold beer to get them turned. <laughs> so this would be the job for a man at an amusement park, let's say, on a Sunday afternoon. Yes, a steady job. They'd go for eight or ten hours in a row. They turn very easy. Well, I suppose they'd have to if you could keep going at that rate. How many different horns do we have on here you've restored it paul do you do you know by any chance and maybe we should get you so you can the number still see yeah uh, still see your face here there, there's about 325 or 26 uh pipe in the uh machine of course it has flagellettes piccolos violin pipes uh flute pipes of course you're looking at the trombones on top of the machine the very top row then it has uh, 20 trumpets and a full set, there are two octaves of uh, clarinet pipes. 
plus all the bass that's underneath the bottom of the machine. One of those uh, musical rolls that you showed us is made of cardboard. Now, were they able to stand up through the years, or do you have them made today? Oh, I can. I have a friend in Europe and makes them for me as a hobby. But unless they get wet or you mistreat them, they last for years. They're made out of a special paper made in Sweden. Now, how does he manage to arrange for this machine? And I guess you do have to do that. Oh, yes. You send the piano score. Of course, he has a little layout table. He puts the paper down lengthwise of the table and marks the notes right off the piano score. And then when he gets them marked on the paper, he has a foot press with an oblong punch that is foot operated, and he runs it through and cuts each hole individually. It's quite a laborious uh, process. Well, I guess it must be. And as a matter of fact, you travel with these units, with these machines, to uh, several fairs a year, don't you? In, in addition, of course, to your gay 90s village in uh, Saxton, Missouri. We try to make about two fairs a year. If I was a lot younger, I'd make a half a dozen. But this works you to death about 14 hours a day. How many people travel with you? We have, well, six of us all together. Now, are they related? Well, I have a cousin. Uh, that he and his wife travel with us. He just retired from electrical business in Portland, Oregon. His name is Virgil Akins. And I have Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Vic Sturkin out of Michigan City, Indiana, who sold an amusement park and retired about three years ago. So they're all living easy but me. I'm working uh, like seven days a week. <laughs> but you love it, I know, Paul. Oh, yes, yes. Tell you what we're going to do. I want you to load the machine, and we're going to listen to another song, and then we're going to see other parts of your collection. We'll see all of the, uh, the instruments for uh, telling your fortune and telling the future and so on. But let's go over here and uh, Would you load like her to, up. Uh, let me call you Sweetheart or somewhere in my life. Oh, you may call me Sweetheart if you'd like. Sure. Go ahead. Oh, you mean the name of the song. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Just reach in there like you would pick out a record album. I think I left it over there for you, yeah. You load it up. Not unlike a tape recorder today, I guess. And uh, here we go. While Sadie Mae was doing her thing and playing her song, we moved over to the other side of the tent to look at Paul's arcade equipment. Now, Paul, these were the uh, types of machines that would tell your fortune, show you movies, and, uh, oh, just generally give you a good time. 
at the Penny Arcade. And they did, in those days at least, go for a penny, didn't they? Yes, all the machines were originally operated on a penny. A uh, penny gave you a lot for your money in those days, sure, You'd it? take a quarter and spend all day, you know. <laughs> now, what vintage, Paul, do these machines represent? They go anywhere from about 1890 up into about 1930. Are they relatively hard to come by? Well, they're, they're really a little bit scarce now, and the time it takes to recondition them is staggering. I can imagine, because there are so many parts involved. Speaking of reconditionings, speaking of actually reconstructive work, let's talk about 14 early American scenes. Where did this instrument come from? Well, I picked this up in New Orleans uh, about three years ago, and it had gone through Hurricane Hilda, I believe, or whatever it was in 64. Mm-hmm. This thing stood under about five feet of water for, you know, like a, a part of a night and part of a day. So it uh, must have been in great need of restoration. How much did you do? Well, the only thing we used were the rough castings. We made a complete new cabinet, had all the castings chromed, and uh, made the machine just like new. Well, it certainly looks like new. This is a stereopticon machine, isn't it? Yes, it is. They call them a drop picture machine at the time. And you would see in three dimension your favorite scenes, 14 of them, as a matter of fact. Now, we're going to do what you're not able to do ordinarily at a penny arcade. We're going to open this machine up and let's see how it works. And it is a rather complex mechanism. And uh, you can see, perhaps, the, uh, the cards. This is what would be known as a stereopticon slide or card. Two pictures, one just a little bit different from the other to give you the three dimension when you look through. Got a nickel, Paul? Maybe we can, uh, all right, I'll... Uh, I'll loan it to you, because I'll get it back. Okay, that's right. That's when you're in business for yourself. It's, it's wonderful. Drop the nickel in there, and you can see the workings of it. The motor starts, and uh, they begin to flip around. You have, what, two or three seconds for each picture? Well, it looks like about maybe three seconds or four. And, of course, you're viewing from the top through here, so that uh, you get a, a feeling of the three dimensions. Paul, do you... Uh, have to replace those cards from time to time? Well, there's really no wear out to the card. I suppose not. They're framed in metal, and there isn't that much movement to them. No, that's right. All right, we're almost around to the 14 cards. And uh, when we get our pennies worth, or in this case, your five cents worth, why well, we can shut the machine off and go on to something else. Well, there we go. All right, let's do that. And let's move on to uh, a girlfriend of ours. Sister Patricia. She's one of your favorites, I know, Paul. Yes, she is. I have a daughter named Patricia. You didn't name her after the machine, did you? Named the machine after her. <laughs> what condition was this machine in when you found it? Well, it was a total wreck. We picked it up in the desert uh, east of uh, Tucson, Arizona, two years ago. And about all we had was the body of the uh, lady, the head, and the thumb on her right hand. And the rest of it we uh, created... Of course, we had the bucket, the brass bucket that she dumps the card in. Yes, and Sister Patricia actually hands you the card, doesn't she? Yes, it's a marvelous piece of automation to be made in 1891. Let's take a look at how Sister Patricia works. Let me use your nickels. You're getting your money, but you're 10 cents. <laughs> yeah, I'm losing twice as much. <laughs> All right, take a look at her. There she goes. She's reaching into the machine there. And now it's coming uh, somebody's fortune. This is yours. Oh, is it mine? Like it. All right, let's 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 find out what it says. Life is made up of sobs, sniffles, and smiles. Smile, and the world will smile with you. Sniffle, and I guess you have hay fever. I, uh... <laughs> All right, well, this is an interesting one here. Get a photograph of your future partner and family with a fortune of your married life. How many babies will you have? Put one coin in slot, push slide in, then pull out slowly and receive card. You better uh, use your nickel. I'm out of All right, nickel. you're out of nickel. I've got a pocket full of nickels here. Now, you have to be very careful with a machine like this. You have to be either a gentleman or a lady. Well, not necessarily to put the nickel in. Oh, I, you can get away with it without right. that. I see. All right, well, I'll, I'll try the, uh, the gentleman over here, and we'll see what we find. Oh, this is, yeah, five cents. Here we go. Oh, it comes out. All oh, right. We'll do a winner. I sure did. Would you like Would you like to take a look at this? Would you like to see that? Your future wife, your future children, all six of them. All right, your future wife, 
will be a nurse. As a matter of fact, my wife is a nurse. This is a little uncanny. Yeah, all right. She will be good for your headache. The headache you have the day after, it says here. She has some definite ideas as to the kind of man she wants, and after you are married, we'll try to make you over by manicuring your nails and painting them red, filing the fuzz off your tongue, and giving you plenty of paragoric to keep your temperature down. <laughs> your hitch will result in six little pill boxes. <laughs> well, we're going to have to work on that machine. You got a dime message there for a nickel. Oh, did I really? Yes, I did. guess I did, yeah. All right, let's find out about the next one. Get a photo and description of your ideal love mate. Know your faults and virtues and learn how to be happy if and when married. Put one coin in slot, push slide in, then pull out slowly and receive card. These, uh, are these from any particular amusement area, Paul? Well, they've been putting the same card out, I, I imagine, for 30 or 40 years. Same one. The machines, where did they come from? Well, they were made in uh, Chicago by Exhibit Supply Company many years ago. All right. Let's try this one. Gentlemen, over here. Put the coin in the slot there. We'll back out. And here is, here is your ideal love mate. Your ideal mate is pretty, pulchritudinous, and plain, sweet, suave, and sensible. Gay, glamorous, and genuine. Winsome, witty, and wise. Loyal, loving, helpful, and cheerful. That goes back to about what, 1920 or so, would you say? I'd say this is in the 20s, yes. Uh, judging from that hairstyle, it was hard to tell today. Okay, <laughs> let's go on to the next one here. And um, this one, I guess, gives you a license for just about anything. Yeah, there's about 25, I think. Anything from bootlegging to uh, driving. I see a spooning license there, a license to become a blonde. Okay, gentlemen, try this. I think I'm going to pull the machine over here, Paul. Did you maybe get a hold of it? Oh, good, okay. All right. <laughs> this is a free gas permit. Uh-huh, this certifies that the holder, being almost the owner of a jalopy and having made the payments as promptly as possible and when unavoidable on said jalopy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Now I'm a member officially of the Society of Road Hogs, I see. That's right. It only cost a nickel. <laughs> Let's see some movies. Right. These machines were great fun, and uh, for a penny in those days, you would see, in this case, a picture of the farmer's daughter you might see some scenes of uh, World War I. But how do they work? We're going to find that out. You have the special key, Paul. We can start it up and uh, show you how it works. All right. Let's open up the uh, side panel here. This one looks like it's ready for business. I see the light is on. Now, ordinarily, the light wouldn't go on until you put your nickel in there. Well, someone had started it and not completed the uh, sequence. All right. Now, what we thought were movies are of course movies but not on film they're on individual paper cards well what happened they took a movie film and shot each frame and put it on uh, on paper so you really get uh, a, a movie very much and as a matter of fact it's the same principle as uh, flipping a, a little book and, and seeing a figure moving in the uh, in the corner of it exactly, that's that sort of yeah. idea yeah uh, I wonder how many pictures to make a, a sequence. There are quite a number of there, and uh, if you turn it at a constant speed, you get a very smooth piece of action. Yes, just like a just like a real moving picture, including the flicker. If you find something you like to look at, you just stop and take okay, a good keep, look. Keep see? going. I'll uh, I'll tell you when to stop there. This obviously was some sort of a slapstick comedy. They probably took a scene from a a short and uh, condensed it, put it on this uh, unit here, and people could watch for a penny. This must have been a, a very thrilling experience for people in those days because uh, movies were not that generally popular, I suppose, in the early 1900s, and they were getting a first chance to, to look at one up close. For a penny. For a penny. You couldn't beat that. Paul, do these cards tend to wear out? Do they last over the years? Well, uh, the reel that's in there now, I'm sure, is at least... Uh, 40 years old. And it has been in constant use? Yes. I w well, you know, not every day, but it's probably been turned several thousand times. I, I imagine 40, 50,000 times. 
All right, let's move on to another one. As a matter of fact, you know, it's one thing to talk about uh, what we're seeing, but it's quite another to actually um, look into the machine. And we're going to do that now. I'll, uh, I'll put the nickel in, and uh, we're going to see a fight. The official motion pictures of the heavyweight boxing contest between Gene Tunney, heavyweight champion of the world, and Jack Dempsey, contender for the heavyweight champion of the world. Okay, here we go. quite a fight, wasn't it? Yes, it was. It's <laughs> still good to see. I think this one, Paul, is uh, my very favorite. Grandmother predictions. This lovely hand-carved lady is of wood. She only has one eye. This fine machine has been completely restored and is a far cry from what it was when we obtained it. Formerly used in the old Forest Park Highlands in St. Louis, Missouri, quite a number of years ago, she has been to Madison Square Garden and has been seen on NBC and ABC TV news specials has been in Illinois and Tennessee. I guess grandmother really got around, didn't she? She was quite a traveling old lady. Matter of fact, um, many of these machines were built by the same company, Mutoscope. Yes, they were. In fact, they're, uh, they're located in Brooklyn, I believe. They still do some building of uh, arcade equipment. Nothing like this, of course. Of course, they, they must have to supply you with, with cards for the machines, do they? Well, the, the reels, the pictures we just saw on the reel are no longer obtainable. You have to find someone who's had them stored in a barn or something, you know. What about Grandma? Well, yes, we get cards for her. All we right. Them, yes. Let's find out what uh, Grandma has. Do you have a dime? Okay, yeah. we'll use your dime. It's your machine. Cheap. Okay. Here we go. She's looking over the cards now, winking and blinking that one eye. And in a moment, we'll find out what she's going to have to say. Well, she's really giving this some thought here, Paul, isn't she? Yeah, she's going to pick you out a good fortune. Okay. Let's see. The early bird gets the worm. In other words, don't overlook any possibilities. Look around you, for you're soon destined to meet the ideal of your dreams in some public place. I wonder who that might be. Boy, you can't tell, but it's bound to happen. <laughs> Paul Akins, I want to thank you very much for sharing your Gay 90s Village with our television audience today. And if you're coming up to the Springfield Exposition, by all means, stop in and uh, see the machines, try them out, and hear the, the fun of the music. And if you're ever out to Sykeston, Missouri, stop in and say hello to Paul Akins. Thank you very much. This is Dick Bertel.